So hello to all. Uh, welcome um, to the um, EAS South German Section Colloquium. Uh, I'm Ban Shahin, and I feel uh, honored to moderate uh, today's colloquium uh, on behalf of the EAS South German Section today. And um, we will have uh, two presentations today, around 30 minutes per presentation. Um, and following, we will have a um, 15 to 30 minutes Q&A session where you can ask your questions after the presentations. Um, our presenters today are all from the uh, Stuttgart Media University, and let's get to know them a bit closer. Um, starting with uh, Leon Hoffman. He's a planning engineer for AV and media technology installations in theaters and event locations. Um, he received a Bachelor of Engineering in Media and Acoustical Engineering from the Mitvaida University of Applied Sciences and graduated from Stuttgart Media University with a Master of Engineering in Audiovisual Media. Our second presenter is Jonas Kisa. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Engineering degree from the Audiovisual Media, where he specialized in media production. He's graduated from the master's program in the Audiovisual Media at Stuttgart Media University with a focus on uh, special audio and creative media conception. He was also uh, visiting the Institute of Electronic Music and Acoustics for a semester uh, with a focus on um, advanced sound design methods. So our third presenter is Maurice Strobe. Um, he received a Bachelor of Arts in Sound and Music Production from the University of Applied Sciences, Darmstadt while specializing in theater sound at Staatstheater Darmstadt. Um, currently, Maurice is finishing his master's degree in audiovisual media at Stuttgart Media University. Um, he's currently working as a Tonmeister at uh, Staatstheater Stuttgart. Um, while freelancing as a musician, sound designer and sound engineer in parallel. So um, a warm welcome to all of our presenters. Um, now I'd like to leave the microphone to um, Professor Frank Melchior um, to um, present the topics as the supervisor and then um, we'll have a look at the presentations. So Frank, Brilliant. is yours. Thank you, Banu, for this uh, kind introduction. And also, thank you very much indeed for having us and uh, let us doing this uh, Stuttgart Media University special. Let's, let's put it this way. Um, I won't say much. Uh, these are all master thesis results we will see today. Um, so two will be on one topic and the other one on another topic but what they all have together is they all dealing with the aspect of producing 3d audio and looking on the really production side so it's one about the recording specifically for 3d audio and the other one is about how create an instrument which is capable of yeah giving real 3d audio output and not just a mono feed which is then penned so this is the general topic for this evening and um the first presentation will be done by maurice and leon and they will talk about the reproduction of auditory width for acoustical instruments in immersive audio production using a three channel spot microphone arrangement and they both have worked on this um, leon has started with it doing some recordings doing initial tests also developing some tools and uh, pieces for this setup and verifying that it actually works and then maurice has looked into how can we make this um, a tool how can we turn this into something which you can use as a sound engineer and so we thought let's put it together in one presentation and i would say the floor is yours let's listen to yeah how we actually can record individual acoustic instruments with auditory width. Yeah, thank you, Frank. 
Uh, I will just share my screen uh, now. Now you should be able to see my screen and presentation. Um, yeah, as Frank said, uh, over the last few months, Leon and I have been working on reproducing the auditory width of individual acoustic instruments in immersive audio productions using a three-channel spot microphone arrangement. And today we, we will present the initial system description, the anechoic test recordings, and our approach for software decoding and panning. Um, our work was, as been said, supervised by Professor Frank Melchior and Oliver Kurt from Hochschule der Medien, Stuttgart Media University, um, and Benjamin Müller from Fraunhofer Institute for Building Physics that cooperated with us on this project. And without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Leon. All right, thanks, Maurice. Um, so first thing is the motivation. Uh, so why did we want to do a spot microphone for a multidimensional mix? Let's say we want to record a small ensemble consisting of these five instruments you can see on the slide. Um, for a traditional stereo production, it's quite obvious what we're going to do. Every instrument would get its probably mono uh, close microphone and we can place uh, the signal somewhere between the left and the right speaker. So we will get uh, something like that. Yes. But what about an immersive 3D production? Of course, we can do the same thing here and put every instrument somewhere in the panorama between the left and the right speaker and use all the other speakers to reproduce an immersive 3D reverb, for example. But uh, in case of such a small ensemble, um, wouldn't it be helpful to be able to fill the available space with a bigger display of these single instruments to get a display of ideally something like that? In literature, there are plenty of suggestions for 3D main microphones to record big ensembles in a hall. For example, you can check the recent work of uh, Hyunkook Lee, which I put on the slide there. But um, so far, you can barely find uh, principles to fill the available space in a multidimensional mix with extended displays of single instruments in recent literature. And that is why we created and tested a spot microphone arrangement to get an immersive, extended and ideally realistic display of a single instrument. So what do we know? Um, besides various other parameters like overall loudness and density of harmonics, a low correlation between the ear signals leads to a larger source width. For higher frequencies, this happens when a sound pressure level on one ear is higher than on the other. And for lower frequencies, there have to be phase shifts due to delay in time of arrival at the ear. But there are also restrictions, especially in vertical uh, direction, um, named uh, the pitch height effect, for example. That means low frequencies are always uh, perceived at ear level. So only high frequencies can really have width in the vertical direction. To achieve the needed decorrelation, we build with our system on the natural directivity of the instrument. You can see here uh, playing different notes on a guitar or on a clarinet, for example, um, varies the origin of sound of a specific frequency band. And to capture this effect and use it for the extended reproduction of a single instrument, we decided to use two coincident microphone setups based on the mid-side principle. And we called it MHV as a working title, which stands for mid, horizontal and vertical. And that is because it consists of those three microphones that you can see there. Um, the, at first, the mid microphone, the cardioid mid signal, and the two figure of eight microphones for horizontal and vertical direction. So MHV, 
mid horizontal vertical. You can see the MHV basis on two MS stereo pairs that share the same mid microphone. Um, here's another reference to a 3D main microphone that is also using a coincident MS setup for the vertical dimension. So in reality, it looks like this. This is a picture of an early test um, where I installed the, the microphones on a stereo microphone bar. And the tests made clear that um, it's better to have a fixed installation without a stereo bar, so without worrying about angles. And that's why a dear colleague of mine created a microphone clip as a 3D print, which you can see here. Um, yeah, the, the main reasons why we decided for this coincident MS setups are the following. Um, at first, the MS principle allows for flexible pro, uh, post processing as varying the figure of eight levels um, varies the source width. Further, um, as it is a coincident setup, it's perfect for down mixing. So high down mix compatibility and um, with the respective clip, it's a small and fixed setup on one microphone stand. So once it is installed, you don't have to worry about angles or capsule distances anymore. Now let's talk about the reproduction side. The question is how to get from the left picture to the right. So how to get from the microphone signals MHV to uh, discrete or virtual source positions in a loudspeaker system, like on the right. What we did is we did two times MS decoding. So the microphone signals mid, horizontal and vertical are decoded into the sources left, right, bottom and top. And listening to the mid mic only should have about the same impression as listening to a mono spot mic that is panned in the center between the four speakers. Oops, that was the slide before. And now if you add the figure of eights, um, you kind of spread the instrument in the re respective direction. So here you see the, if you add the uh, horizontal mic, <laughs> ideally it would give that impression. And if we add the vertical figure of eight, it gets like this, ideally, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. And now Maurice will dig a little deeper into the MS principle and its resulting microphone directivities. Yeah, thanks, Leon. Um, yeah, here we see the three dimensional polar plots of the three microphones. Uh, the cardioid pattern for the mid microphone on the left um, and the figure of eight patterns or signals for the horizontal and vertical microphones. Um, to understand the decoding process, it makes more sense to look at the patterns in only two dimensions and also to first look at a conventional MS arrangement. Um, Bloomline first described the famous Bloomline pair with its two offset figure of eight patterns in this two-dimensional way, as we probably know. Um, and we can apply this, of course, to the MS setup, where we can have an offset angle of 90 degrees for the figure of eight S microphone in addition to the cardioid mid signal. Uh, by MS decoding the mid and side signals with different ratios, uh, we, get, we get polar patterns, which are equivalent to XY polar patterns, um, as we can see here. Uh, these can then be described in terms of their directivity um, and their offset angle, which of course goes back um, to the theory that you could, can compose a cardioid uh, polar pattern out of omni and figure of eight uh, patterns. Um, and uh, it is also, uh, you can also describe it with this equation uh, with the omni part and the figure of eight part. And then uh, by applying different ratios of those, um, these um, polar patterns or cardioid shapes. And this applies to our equivalent MS XY signals here seen in the two dimensional plane. Uh, so we can uh, describe a ratio of MHV or MS in this case, uh, and then a directivity and, um, uh, and 
yeah, directivity and angle um, of the uh, resulting xy pair equivalent. Um, going back to the three dimensions, here we can see the four resulting equivalent polar patterns of the left, right, bottom, and top signals. Uh, let's talk about the MHV panel, uh, which is a software tool I created for decoding the MHV signals on an immersive speaker setup. Uh, let's take a closer look at the block diagram for this tool. Let's do that later. Let's first talk about API and tools. Uh, the MHV panel was built with and for Max 8, formerly known as Max MSP. Uh, for the audio processing, I've used the SPAT5 uh, Max external library, namely the virtual speaker object, the panel object, uh, and their OSC messaging architecture. Uh, for the UI, I've used mainly native Max UI objects for simplicity. Um, for the polar plot section of the UI, I used Max's uh, JavaScript UI object with its proprietary OpenGL class. Um, the panning visualization is actually an embed embedded SPAT viewer object, which is not very performant, but serves its purpose well. Um, there are two delivery formats for this plugin. Uh, first, a standalone rec type Max app with multiple instances of the MHV panel for use with a virtual sound card in any DAW. And second, a Max for Live implementation for use as an actual plugin within Ableton Live, uh, with a few limitations due to Ableton not really being very multi channel audio friendly. I like to say at this point, the whole MHV panel project is still very much a work in progress. Um, the next possible step after my research is done would be a VST plugin implementation, for example, uh, for use in other DAWs that are more suited to multi-channel audio, for example, Reaper. Let's take a look at the various processing blocks of the MHV panel plugin. Uh, starting on the left, we have our three native MHV signals. These are then decoded into left, right, bottom, and top by applying a rather simple MS matrix um, to MH and MV as uh, two MS stereophonic pairs. These four signals are then treated as virtual sound sources um, by the SPAT pan object by panning panning them via um, vector-based amplitude panning uh, on a multi-speaker setup. For testing purposes, there is an optional binauralization uh, block uh, for headphone playback, which we will hear today. The UI of the MHV panel is split into three sections, the de decoding section, the panning section, and the routing and metering section. Um, these are uh, divided in two. Um, the decoding section contains polar pattern viewer, a polar pattern viewer to monitor either the native polar patterns and their gain or the equivalent XY patterns with their respective change in angle and directivity as we discussed. Uh, and for changing the ratio between the three signals, there's a mixing section with faders uh, and metering for the three mic signals. The panning section uh, contains panning controls for position and spread, as well as the spatial layout for, for, for the four virtual sound sources. The mon to monitor the position, there's a panning viewer where you can see the source and loudspeaker positions. Next to that um, are more panning parameters uh, for change, changing the algorithm and switching on off uh, phantom speakers. And on the far right, you can see a routing and metering section, which is very similar to the native surround panel plugin of Ableton. In a separate window down here uh, is a metering of the applied gain factors per input channel and speaker. And this is very useful for monitoring the crosstalk between speakers, uh, which in general you want to avoid, as Leon said, uh, when reproducing with Uh, and now I'd like to present a quick demonstrational video to show all the parameters and the UI in action. Uh, you will see the main UI on screen as well as the speaker gain window uh, down here. 
Um, the anechoic recording we're about to hear is something Leon will talk about later in greater detail. Um, please use headphones if possible, because we will listen to binaural audio now. Yeah, that was uh, the short, very short demonstration of uh, all the parameters uh, of the plugin, uh, and also the effect that width has uh, in comparison to the actual mono um, mono signal. Yeah, and now back to you, Leon. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, to test the MHV, we carried out as you already heard and now you can see it, we carried out uh, anechoic recordings at the anechoic chamber of the Fraunhofer Institute for Building Physics in Stuttgart. Um, we recorded various instruments using three MHV positions on each instrument. And in total, we recorded 10 instruments and two singers, one at a time. Um, and they played an arrangement of the traditional song Scarborough Fair that I created for this purpose so that all instruments together in the end can work as a complete immersive audio mix. Yeah, and now you're probably asking how does it sound? Um, this is a quick teaser how the whole ensemble can sound using the MHV. Again, please use headphones as it is binaural audio, of course. Um, we used a prototype version of uh, Fraunhofer EES 3D Reverb for panning uh, this, the virtual sources in a, a 7 plus 4 speaker setup. And also to add reverb, of course, as those were anechoic dry signals. Um, the stereo mix you're listening to is the binaris, uh, binauralization of the loudspeaker positions uh, of the 7 plus 4 setup um, using the Sparta binauralizer plugin. And now we have a quick listen. And then she And now you come into play if you want to. <laughs> the final demo production, so the whole uh, song with video can be found online in uh, uh, on this YouTube link. I will post all the links uh, in a minute in the chat. Um, there's also an AES engineering brief in the uh, e-library about the topic. Um, 
and also um, you can download and uh, try out the raw anechoic MHV signals, the multitracks of the song, um, following the third link. Because um, surely there are plenty of ways to use the material and to use other forms of decoding or panning than, than we did. And so feel free to, to try it out and to contact us with questions and comments. And uh, well, now the, the only thing left to say is thank you for your attention. And you're very welcome to ask some questions later in the Q&A part after Jonas presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the, the other thing left to say is thank you guys, uh, Maurice and Leon, for this very nice presentation. Um, and I think I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. However, uh, one thing I'd like to add, that is first we will post these links into the chat as well so that you can just click on them right now. Um, I guess Maurice or Leon will do this. And the other thing is um, this will be presented at the Tonmeister Tagung as well. So if you want to have a chat with the authors and have a deep dive uh, and maybe not available to stay after six, um, then there's another chance to have a conversation ab about the ideas, the concept and what you may think is the better way to do it. So we are really keen to hear from you guys what else can be done with the material. Um, but for now, I guess we switch over to Jonas for the second presentation. So we'll do the question and answers after both presentations. And um, his topic will also be on the side of producing for 3D audio, but he will present an object-based spatial wavetable synthesizer. So really doing the electronic side of things and looking into how we can generate sounds and use them in 3D setups. So the floor is yours, Jonas, please. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you, Maurice and uh, Leon for this interesting presentation. So I dealt with this in my master thesis and I will show you an extract now. Um, I, the, the initial idea came during a production for the student 3D audio production competition last year, where I produced a pop music song and I was looking for instruments with native 3D audio output, but hardly found any. So, um, I had mainly two questions. How can 3D audio be integrated in a virtual wavetable synthesizer? And how do experts um, from the fields of composition, sound design, as well as post-production evaluate the proposals made in the prototyping implementation? So I see the implementation as a first draft that should be evaluated with experts um, with qualitative interviews. So, my main point is considering spatialization not as a part of post-production in a final step of a long production uh, chain, but, but rather put it first and consider it as part of the composition. So um, yeah, the approach is to integrate it into a virtual instrument. Spatiality has always been a musical dimension in traditional music but it, um, it was in the interest of the composers of electroacoustic music since the beginning of sound tree productions. So Stockhausen, for example, had an interest in um, spatial movement of sounding objects, as well as the envelopment of the listener. Um, on the right, you see a picture of Acosmonium. It's like a diffuse loudspeaker orchestra. That's still a phenomena. Um, I would like to point out that there are several experiments with synthesis and spatialization have been carried out already I'm not the first one with this idea um, and the, the projects with additive synthesis mainly distribute single partials in space whereas with granular granular synthesis the the single grains are spread out in space and there are listed some more um, but there are listed some experiments if you're interested you will find a lot about them in the internet um, and since my prototype takes an object-based approach on the production side, I have to mention that there have been projects that try to establish object-based formats for production, but they have not become that uh, established. Mm, I will do a few basics that will help understand the concept of the spatial 
wavetable synthesizer. I mean, if you are familiar with sound synthesis, this may be a bit boring, but I will go through some basics. Um, with wavetable synthesis, a wide range of different timbres can be created in a simple and efficient way. And um, this method is often used for in, in modern pop music productions in um, synthesizers like serum, pigments, massive, and so on. And simply put, the, the sample values of waveform stored in a buffer, in my case, 1024 samples, represent one frame. Um, and the buffer is spread out by a phaser while the values get interpolated dependent on the pitch. So it's possible to cascadate the frames of different waveforms in one buffer, and that enables morphing through the waveform over time. Um, that's done by fading these waveforms into each other. And with this approach, it is possible to change the overtone spectrum over time easily. So um, this block diagram represents um, a basic synthesis block. It's not wavetable specific, it's a general approach. It, it contains the sound generating logic for one tone or for, for, for one voice. Um, it, we have incoming MIDI messages, and then the basic components are the pitch calculation with pitch bend and glide and modulations like vibrato, then afterwards the, the oscillator, then the, the uh, filter, like on subtractive, subtractive synthesis, and in the end, an amplitude envelope that defines the start and the end of, of the note, as well as the volume over time. So and if you want to play harmonies or chords, you need a polyphonic synthesizer. Um, it's made of several parallel instances of the sound synthesis block, and the incoming MIDI messages get managed by a voice allocation um, so or a voice management algorithm that assigns the messages to available voices and if there are no voices left it will cancel the um, note that the, the longest note active so it's called the voice stealing yeah these are the relevant basics for synthesis for my uh, concept and yeah, what is the purpose of a 3D audio system? I really like this definition. Um, a 3D audio system aims to produce auditory events that can be freely manipulated in terms of direction, distance, spatial extent, and their acoustic environment. And of course, that can be perceived by as many listeners as possible with as many identical characteristics, characteristics as possible. That's an ideal. But the first part, I think it's very important um, from a sound design perspective, this four attributes, and sometimes it's good to keep in mind while producing. And um, for my purposes, I define spatialization in the following way as the process of designing those spatial attributes of an auditory event. Um, and the spatial wavetable synthesizer does this without a 3D audio reverb. So it focuses on direction and extent because for distance and acoustic environment, you would need some kind of room simulation. Um, so it's uh, limited to direction and extent. It works with the dry components of the synthesis. Um, before I show you a few demo videos of the synthesizer, I wanna explain the system integration. Um, it, the spatial wavetable synthesizer takes an format agnostic approach. It's not made with a specific, specific format in mind. Uh, one could argue that object-based is already a representation form, but um, the object-based approach is more considered as an intermediate step between the synthesis and the rendering. It's not for distribution. So in object is basically in signal plus metadata. And in my case, the metadata um, consists of the azimuth and elevation angle. So that describes the, the object position on a spherical surface. Um, so we have the incoming MIDI messages. And in the virtual instrument, the sound synthesis takes place, as well as the objectification of sound components that could be polyphonic voices or parallel oscillators, but we get to this later in more detail. Then the output are the objects um, with audio signals and the metadata. 
um, and then it gets rendered. And um, my work doesn't focus on the rendering. It may have um, yeah, an impact on how it will sound, but I really like this citation um, from the expert interviews from Jan Langhammer. Artifacts in the rendering are part of the sound design, either it fits or it doesn't fit. So I think that's a good perspective for my, for my approach. Mm. This slide is basically the same, but more specific. It shows the um, specific, the concrete implementation. I worked with Max 8 or Maxims P as well, um, like, like Maurice, because it's a very flexible and straightforward environment for prototyping. But you only can integrate the, the Max for Life patches in Ableton. And yeah, Ableton Live isn't 3D audio capable at all. Um, so I outsourced the, the 3D audio rendering part to Reaper. Um, the communication here um, is made by uh, OSC messages, and they were synced, the two DAWs were synced via um, MIDI timecode. So, and for the rendering part, that, uh, that brings me to the next slide. Um, the, the output, as already mentioned, are the audio signals and the calculated directions for the objects. Um, they, they go into the um, encoder. I decided on a HOA workflow, and I used the plugins from the IEM plugin suite because they're great and they're <laughs> open source and have an open interface. Um, they are fully controllable via OSC. So the encoder encodes into a um, fifth order ambisonic scene that could be rotated um, dependent, depending on the information the, the head tracker mounted on my uh, headphones sense. And afterwards, the scene um, will be decoded into loudspeaker signals of a specific 3D audio studio, the Produktionsstudio in Graz. And these loudspeaker signals get convoluted with binaural room impulse response measured with a um, Neumann KU100, I think, to get um, an, an binauralization and the convolution with a room impulse response is really not the baddest thing in, for externalization. So yeah, that's what you will listen to in the demo videos. Okay, now we come to the main part after the, the system um, integration, the, the spatial wavetable synthesizer, the important thing. Um, yeah, I, I implemented two main concepts. The first thing is the objectification of sound components, as I already said, either polyphonic voices or different oscillators that I call layers. And the second concept is um, the dynamic panning of objects through envelopes, LFOs, and MIDI input. So the control signals that are um, crucial for um, shaping the sound um, in the synthesis process, they're now also available for movements of the sound, uh, of the audio objects. Um, and I implemented kind of a macroscopic control for the spatial extent. It's called the anchor. It's self-explaining in the videos. Um, so you're seeing um, here the main window from, from Ableton Live. Here's the spatial synthesizer. On the right, we have the um, sound producing sound synthesis parameters. Um, on the right are the, the parameters for spatialization. Here's a rectangular projection of the sphere. Um, here are a modulation matrix for the movement things in case you um, don't know this is the the multi encoder I use for the rendering from IEM and an energy visualizer um, for the HOA scene so and the the FM8 is only for uh, monitoring the the media input uh, the the voiceover is German sorry for that but I did English subtitles so everyone can follow okay I will start the demo in case um, it's not it's not by normal i will post a link in the chat it's it's the vimeo channel with this um videos maybe there it's working but 
just in case this doesn't work for you. So, okay, let's start the first video. Für das erste Beispiel nehmen wir mal den Layer Mode her, aktivieren den ersten Oszillator, routen den auf das Objekt 1, starten wir prinzipiell nur mit einem Objekt, nehmen einen anderen Wave Table, ein bisschen was am Sound schrauben. Die initiale Position dieses Objekts im Raum verändern. Und dem Objekt noch eine Bewegung mitgeben, indem wir hier Movement aktivieren. Jetzt meine ganz einfache Rotation um die Z-Achse, zum Beispiel beim LFO2, Wellenform ab, also ein Sägezahn auswählen und dann mit dem Azimut modulieren. Jetzt dreht er. Zusätzlich könnte man zum Beispiel noch den Filter Envelope, die Elevation geben. The second example um, shows how slight rhythmic spatial movement can add kind of micromodulation to the sound. It's again in layer mode and um, it shows how decorrelation um, can be added if one oscillator is routed to two objects. Yeah. Das zweite Beispiel nehmen wir mal drei Objekte her. Den ersten Oszillator routen wir wieder auf das Objekt 1. Den zweiten Oszillator routen wir auf die Objekte 2 und 3. Hm, vielleicht eine Oktave tiefer. Jetzt geht ja das gleiche Signal drauf. Das können wir aber etwas dekorrelieren. Nehmen wir diesen Spread, der macht einen Pitch Shift zwischen den beiden. Jetzt ein bisschen weiter. Jetzt können wir da noch eine Bewegung drauflegen. Vielleicht wieder auf das Objekt 1. Klingen sie zusammen. Oscillator 2 ein bisschen laut. So, auf das Objekt 1. Vielleicht wieder die Rotation um die Z-Achse. Mit dem zweiten LFO Variation in der Elevation. Und auf die Objekte 2 und 3 könnte man zum Beispiel den Filter Envelope, die Elevation legen. Zusätzlich noch ein bisschen den LFO auf den Azimut. Yeah, so the movement could add kind of liveliness in sound. And the third example demonstrates the voice mode with one oscillator and five objects, and it also introduces uh, the, the anchor mode. Für ein drittes Beispiel wechseln wir mal in den Voices-Modus, wählen fünf Objekte aus, verteilen die mal halbwegs gleichmäßig. Jetzt werden die einzelnen polyphonischen Voices, also die einzelne Noten, die gespielt werden, der Reihe nach auf die Objekte verteilt. Jetzt könnte man hier zum Beispiel den Anchor-Modus mal aktivieren. Da setzt man einen Schwerpunkt irgendwo im Raum und kann dann quasi alle Objekte dahin ziehen. Zum Beispiel moduliert über den LFO. Oder aber zum Beispiel auch über die Velocity. And last but not least, there's another um, sample for the voice mode. 
Für dieses Klangbeispiel sind wir im Voices-Modus, so einen Marimba-ähnlichen Sound, verteilen den auf fünf verschiedene Objekte und die werden bewegt über den LFO und zwar moduliert der die Roll-Rotation. Hören uns den Clip mal an. Jetzt aktiviere ich zusätzlich noch den Anchor-Modus und moduliere den ebenfalls über den LFO. Okay, I hope you got an impression of what it does. Um, I prepared some more technical slides with block diagrams, but I'll keep it short <laughs> due to the time left. So um, the sound synthesis block of the spatial wavetable synthesizer has five oscillator groups. Um, and one group consists of two oscillators that can be detuned against each other for the, for the spread I, I showed in the second video. Um, and yeah, the special thing about this um, about it is that they, the, the parallel oscillators in one block, they didn't get summed up like usual. Um, they get summed um, dependent on, on the mode chosen, either voice mode or layer mode. So um, if, if the synthesizer is in layer mode, um, the, the oscillators, for example, oscillator 1A from all voices get summed up and routed to the object dependent on the setting in the UI. And in um, voice mode, all oscillators of one voice get summed up. And then the routing is arbitrary. As a, um, it, it's dependent on how many objects you, you've chosen in the UI. And it's easily to imagine that this one uh, was the main critic point in the evaluation that you have no control um, to which object one, one node um, is, will be routed. So this is an overview um, over the direction calculation. Um, I'll keep it short. At, at first, you have the modulation of the azimuth and the elevation angle. They could be modulated by the node number. It's like an offset that helps to, to spread out the keyboard if, if you're interested in this effect um, or modulated yeah, by filter envelope and the LFOs. Afterwards, um, the, the rotation is calculated around the, the three axes, your pitch and roll. I, I have to mention that um, yaw has the same effect like modulating the azimuth. Um, <laughs> and then there is the trans translation, the translation to, to the anchor point for this yeah, control over the, the spatial extent. And finally, the, the moved coordinates um, get, are, are formatted into OSC messages. OK, I would like to use um, the last minutes and talk a bit about the evaluation. I did expert interviews with nine experts. Um, yeah, qualitative interviews with guideline questions and uh, qualitative content analysis. Um, and the interviews were structured into four main parts. The general concept of shifting the spatialization to the composers and the sound designer. Um, the workflow with the, the, the proposals I've, I've made and the objectification of components, the synthesis and the external rendering. Um, yeah, then more in depth, um, the, the sound components, uh, voices and layers, and finally the, the movement of the of objects through the control signals. The, the experts came from the areas um, sound production and post-production both from the application and the development side. So I had composers and sound designers, audio engineers, synthesizer programmers, and post-production tool developers. Um, 
Yeah, and since the categories are not clearly separated from each other, most of the experts have a professional background in more than one field. Um, but this, this matrix shows an overview. Um, you may know one or two names. Um, it's difficult to break down the results into a few slides. I made like 20 pages content analysis. Um, and yeah, for now I refrain from direct quotations because they're very long sometimes. But if you're interested, my, my thesis is online and open access. I have the link on the last slide. You, you can read all the, the, the whole citations. So I've tried to sum up the main, main findings in the four categories. Um, concerning the general concept, they, um, the composers, they confirmed this assumption that the if, if the sound generation and spatialization is on the same stage in the in the production process that leads to different compositional results. Um, and there's also more complexity that has to be arranged it's an additional differentiation level. And the the engineers welcome this approach, but they asked to maintain the possibility of editing the the spatial attributes in post-production um yeah the the integration of spatialization into the synthesizer could be a potential time saver and it's a helpful tool for making sound ideas audible in order to verify their effect sometimes we imagine something oh this would sound cool to spread all the voices and, and then you try it out and um, you recognize mm, maybe we should try something different. So it's a good tool to to um, yeah to verify the the effects. Concerning the workflow, tools could open up new spatial design possibilities. For example, the the distribution of single voices is not possible with um, conventional synthesizers, not in real time. You can export every every voice separately. Um, but some question the perceptibility of single objects. So yeah, that's a fair point. Um, and they asked also for output um, for more panning tools to use Sparta, Panoramic, Spatial Audio Designer, SPAT as well, not only the IEM plugins. Um, and one could um, integrate an additional, uh, one could add an integrated rendering as well. So concerning the, the two modes, the layer mode was evaluated useful, but it's a bit similar to um, a multiband filter with spatialization. There are audio effects that split the signal into bands over the spectrum and then spatialize um, those components. And this approach is more flexible. Um, some asked for more sub oscillators um, and decorrelation features to, to create a more dense sound and for more control over single oscillators, um, for example, independent cut frequency. The, the voice mode was evaluated very good. It's a, it's a new effect. It's interesting, especially for arpeggios. It opens up the space without reverberation. Mm, yeah, but it's, it's a missing musical control of, uh, the, over the distribution of the musical notes um, to the objects. So we need there some advanced features. Um, and finally, the movement. So one thing that was pretty good is the, the LFO sync to the DAW tempo. It's like a musical connection of the movement. Um, they asked for more good sounding and effect oriented effect oriented at the presets for the movement because with a modulation matrix you have so many options it's it's important to to have the option to choose from from a preset bank with configurations that works well um, so the anchor mode is the right direction it's it's easy to use it's a strong effect and the the slight movements that you can add to the objects um, are yeah, kind of a micro modulation that it's always interesting for electronic sounds to to um, make them sound more organic or something. Um, then another interesting idea was the control um, with with audio or con control signals of the 
um, the, the width from other instruments in the project, like a sidechain effect. I think that's pretty cool to connect things together. And in general, more matronops. Um, yeah, these were my two questions. How can 3D audio be integrated in a virtual wave table synthesizer? My, my approach was with, with objectification of the synthesis components and movement through um, the, the control signals of the synthesis with an object-based output and external rendering. And yeah, the last four slides were already a summary of the findings for the, for the second question. So I'm glad to announce a VST version. The development started a few weeks ago. I found a young but very talented programmer, and we are doing our best um, to, to present you a product. Yeah, we will focus on, on polyphonic voices um, and, and leave this layer thing. Um, we will integrate more musical control over um, the distribution of notes to objects. We will integrate an internal rendering with VBAP and maybe HOA and um, extend the external rendering options. So I would like to add different modes to, to differentiate between if we have a surround setting, if we use the upper hemisphere or the full sphere, and we would like to design a more simple UI uh, with, with options for expert modes. And yeah, we are currently experimenting uh, with the integration of a 3D audio reverb, but that's it's, this is optional. So if you're interested in a beta as soon as it is available, please send me a message to this mail address or via LinkedIn or whatever. Um, or otherwise, maybe we see it at Tonmeister Tagung and we can talk about this. Um, yeah, that's the link to the master thesis if you want to read into the details. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for the interest. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Jonas. And I think before we start with the Q&A, uh, I'm sure you all join me for a virtual applause for our presenters. Uh, so thank you very much for keeping it in time. And I think also for the very interesting topics uh, you presented. <clears throat> and now I would say, yeah, we open the floor for questions, thoughts, feedbacks, you may can all place orders. Um, however, um, whatever comes from your end, we're really keen to hear what you think about these ideas, what you think about the examples you've heard, and what are your questions on these projects. <laughs> 